Good morning, folks. Uh, I'm Jim Perkle. I have been a funeral director in Washington, Indiana for the last 52 years. I began my career in funeral service 57 years ago. The reason that the Gill Funeral Home is featured in this take is that it is the oldest continuously operating business in the entire county. Ladies and gentlemen, you're standing on Main Street in Washington, Indiana in 1872. You will notice that the street is dirt. You will also notice that the sidewalk is plank, wooden plank. Now really I've told you that you were standing on street in 1872, however, we did not get a plank sidewalks until 1876. Now you will notice this here is an actual stepping stone that was used in downtown Washington. Usually each business house had about three or four stepping stones outside of their front door. Dirt was packed down terribly but it was as hard as a rock. However, if we would have two or three days of rain, it would become quagmire. And you, a gentleman, you would drive up in your buggy and you let your lady out to whatever store she wanted to go in and she could do it on the stepping stones. When I did get plank sidewalks, they only went in front of the stores, not around the corner. Stepping stones were used as a means to get around the corner. Now this is the actual facade of the very first funeral people that were in Washington. Uh, it was Bonham Brothers. And uh, Joseph Gill came back from the Civil War and he was a craftsman. Now, first off, we, uh, you probably are wondering why the furniture business and undertaking came into being. First off, I'm going to have to tell you that uh, a furniture store was not like dailies on the first floor of this building here. Furniture store, when you went into him, you, he would bring out a book and you would thumb through this book to decide, okay, you would say, I want six chairs made like this. I want a table like this. I want a bed like this. And I want a chest of drawers like this. And then he would build them. And so they were craftsmen. And uh, Joseph Gill, when he came back from the Civil War in 1864, uh, he went to work for Bonham Brothers. So the Gill family has had their background in funeral service uh, back to 1864. But in early 1872, one of the Bonham Brothers passed away. And when they got his estate all settled and everything, then uh, in the 18, still, this was in 1872, 
Joseph Gill purchased his half interest in the business. So it was Bonham and Gill uh, from 1872 on. Now you will notice here that we have the um, tracks for the trolley. Uh, of course, in 1872, the uh, car hadn't even been invented yet. And uh, it was another 30 years before the cars came along. And uh, so the trolley was pulled by a horse, if you will notice. Now the uh, livery stable was a very, very major part of the town because if you wanted to go to Petersburg uh, by yourself, you would rent a horse from the livery stable. If you wanted to take your entire family, you would hire a buggy and a horse to pull it over there. So the uh, buggy was the only means of transportation that we had. Now the furniture uh, people who were the undertakers at the time uh, would have a horse-drawn hearse and uh, horses and they would keep them in the livery stable. What they did is, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you have heard a lot of people say when an undertaker walks in the room, you would say uh, one to the other that, boy, you better look out for him. He's going to measure you up. Furniture people usually had uh, three or four coffins in stock, but they were standard size. And they, if your uh, father had passed away during the night, you would go to the furniture man and he would ask you how tall he was. If he was an exceptionally tall person, of course, naturally, uh, he would have to make a coffin for him. And uh, the old coffins were this way. And uh, the uh, bulge in them was for the elbows. And if he was a shorter person and was rather uh, obese, he would need a wider coffin. So uh, that was why the, uh, the undertakers of old would ask what size the person was. There was no embalming, absolutely no embalming in those days because of the fact that it just hadn't been practiced because of the fact that uh, the family would obey the person and would place them in the clothing. And then the undertaker would bring out the coffin, he would put the person in the coffin, and then would call him to the uh, church the next day. Now this is the Gill family. This is the gentleman here that started the business and that joined the Bonham brothers. It was Bonham and Gill in uh, 1872. Then this James Gill was his son. And then these two men here were the third generation uh, involved in the funeral business and they were his sons. Now these two gentlemen are who I came to work for in 1957. And when they retired in 1974, January, I assumed ownership of the business. Now this bed was one that was made back in the late 1800s. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to get a good night's rest on that? Uh, I suppose a feather bed would have been put on there. Uh, but after all, it was the 1800s. Antique dealer here in town called me one day and uh, he wanted to know if I was busy. And uh, so he said, well, if you could come over. And he showed me this bed and it has J.A. Gill and company on it, permanently etched on it there and he uh, had paid $125 for it. And he told me that he would sell it to me for $25 if 
I would put it in the museum. At that time, the museum was out in Jefferson School. And of course, naturally, I had the station wagon with me at that time. And I said, well, if you can get away, we'll just put it in the car and go out there right now. And so that's how we were able to get an, an old bed that had been made by the original Joseph Gill. Of course, there was no electricity in those days, and there was no radio station. And the people, I think today even, get their mail uh, probably a day late because of the fact that the carrier has to bring it out. And so uh, there was no radio station, and the uh, people in the country especially, uh, and in town, uh, would have to get in their buggy, drive down Main Street, drive down by the funeral home, and they could see who had died and when their funeral would be. Now this is the original framing that was used, and this is the original slate that is used. You can see we had to reinforce the corners on all of this, but this is the original uh, hinges that were used at the time. Uh, the gills kept a lot of uh, equipment, and uh, we're glad of that. This desk, you will notice, is very wide. And in a small office like this, you would not have to have two desks. On this side of the desk are a set of drawers, and on this side of the desk is a set of drawers. The uh, secretary could sit over there, and the boss could sit here, and you only had one uh, desk in the room. Now, I don't know for sure when the telephone first came into being in Washington, Indiana. I'm sure it was in the early, very early 1900s. But anyway, there was a gentleman by the name of Almond Strouger, and he was an undertaker in Kansas City, Missouri. One of the operators in Kansas City, her husband was an undertaker, and he got it in his head some way or another <clears throat> that every time she was on duty and he would call for her number or his number that she was calling her husband. And so anyway, he was quite a tinkerer. And he went into his basement. This almond strouger, it's still called a strouger switch. And he invented the dial telephone in his basement. And uh, today, of course, naturally, you can bypass the operator. We don't even have any operators, I don't think, in, in any, in any, any United States anyway. If you ask an old person like me that uh, uh, that's re has all, ever worked for the uh, telephone company, they will remember the Strouger switch because that is how it was uh, <laughs> done. And that's the only reason we have the dial telephone in here is because of the, of the fact that it was operated by uh, or invented by uh, an undertaker. The Hayes Gill, who was the oldest of the two brothers that I had worked for uh, in the Gill family, uh, he graduated from the Cincinnati College of Embalming in 1922. This is he and his brother, James C. Gill, uh, funeral director's license, and this is their dad's, James A. Gill. Uh, funeral director's license. Now, th this uh, museum, of course, is the old Masonic temple, and the Masons had put two by eights in this uh, ceiling, and, uh, and this is the uh, ladder that they had to get up there, but they wanted the storage, and they wanted to be able to walk on it. But anyway, most of all of the uh, ceilings were 15 foot tall. 
And, uh, you know, you, you wonder if, and all they had for lighting back then was, of course, Aladdin lamps. And uh, if an Aladdin lamp was 15 foot in the air, the only way you could light it or blow it out or put fuel in it was to carry a 15 foot ladder around with you all day. In the interim period, celebrated the 200th birthday of this country in 1976, a lot of business places in this town had uh, old pictures of their establishment way back. And we, one picture, I don't remember what business it was, but one picture had a very close up of the light in the town. And this is just exactly how they did it. They, they would lower the, the, the lamp down they could light it, they could blow it out, or they could put fuel in it. And then, 15 foot up, they would... So, you know, there's tricks to all trade. So that's the way they did it. A chain length uh, was put in and that's how they lowered and raised the light. Anytime you drove down a city street or if you drove down a country road and you passed by a home that had black crepe on the doorknob, then you knew someone in that house had passed away. Now I'm sure that most of you people have been in an older home where they had pocket doors. They went back into the wall and uh, they usually were big oak doors. They would be drawn together. The uh, parlor in an old home was only opened for special occasions. If the minister came to call on you on a Sunday afternoon, you would entertain him in the parlor. If I came to visit you uh, and you took me in the parlor, that meant I rated pretty high in your estimation. They would have a lot of family weddings in the parlor and of course, naturally, they had their funerals in the parlor. Now, if you passed away one day, your funeral was the next day because there absolutely was no embalming whatsoever. Coffins were made like this, they were bulged out at the uh, elbows, and they, you could have a glass plate in the coffin so that you could only see the person's face, and uh, you did not see any other part of them. And there was always uh, a panel that was closed before the uh, coffin was buried. <coughs> Now, you will notice in here that the coffin is not in symmetrical position for the window. See, they on, the only thing that they had was candles and Aladdin lamps for lighting. And so they wanted the coffin to be pulled down this way so that daylight would come in and you could see the person much better. Now this lady uh, who's wearing this dress, she was uh, Annie Campbell Horned, and uh, not haunted, H-A-U-N-T-E-D, but Horned, H-A-R-N-E-D. And she had lost her husband in the late 1800s. They were a very, very, very prominent family in Washington. The house still stands, the old Horned House, and the uh, Horned Avenue goes in front of the house. Uh, there was a street named for them. Now this dress that she wore during her husband's funeral, now it was no state law, but it was 
a very strong tradition. If a lady lost her husband and uh, every time she stepped outside of the house for six months, she had to wear black. Uh, like I say, it was no law, but it was a very strong tradition, and I don't know what they would have called the lady if she would have <laughs> stepped out without wearing black. But anyway, this is the dress that she actually wore when her husband passed away. Now, it was in the late 1800s. Now, if you would take your clothes off today and put them in a, a closet and let them hang for 130 years, I'm sure they would be very fragile. And we just like to never got this garment on this mannequin. But for some reason, for some reason, the uh, people in her family had handed this down for several generations, and they wanted it displayed in our funeral display, and we thought that this would be the best place to put it. So this is the actual dress that uh, Annie Horned wore during her husband's funeral, and uh, every time she had to go out of the house, she did wear black. Uh, I'm sure she didn't wear this same dress, but uh, she had to wear black. Now we had mentioned to you that if you passed away one day, your funeral was the next day because there absolutely was no uh, embalming whatsoever. However, in 1859 or uh, 1860 or 61, a doctor in Chicago by the name of Thomas Holmes had come up with a solution if he injected it into the arterial system would preserve a body. Abraham Lincoln was very taken aback by this because the boys that were killed in, in the south from the north or the boys that were killed in the north from the south could be shipped back to their relatives for their burial purposes. And so today, that you know, that's a strong tradition. I mean, a, a child will graduate from high school, they'll go to four years of college, then they go 400 miles away for a job, live there for 40 years, raise their family there, but when they pass away, they want to come back home to be buried. And I'm sure it was a stronger tradition back then. Abraham Lincoln hired this Thomas Holmes, Dr. Holmes, and uh, he, of course, he had a lot of assistants, and he hired all of them. And there were a lot of battlefield embalmings done, and of course, naturally, they would ship them by train from the battlefield uh, to their relatives. And so anyway, embalming just didn't uh, take over right away. Uh, in 1865, the Civil War was over, and it was 35 years before the turn of the century. But people just didn't accept this. They did not like to have their people buried so quickly, but that's the way it had always been done. And I think if you will remember the very first funeral that you ever remember uh, as a child, that really funerals haven't changed all that much today. Oh yes, we just show them one night instead of two. We do it all at the funeral home instead of at the home. But really, I think that this part of our life is more steeped in tradition than any other aspect of our life. So the people did not appreciate a surgical procedure being performed on their relative after they had passed away. By 1900, 
at least practically everyone in the whole United States was embalmed. When embalming did take hold 1895 or 1900, practically everyone, as we said, was embalmed. But the embalming took place right in your bedroom where you passed away. Uh, the undertaker would have to bring out all of this equipment and uh, into the bedroom. He would put down rubber sheets to keep down the mess, and he would have to bring a cooling board and then cover it with sheets. And this was all of the, the uh, instruments that he would need. And, uh, of course, he'd have to bring the satchels, the fluid that was out of the body, was, was in these containers here. Uh, the, uh, the bed, I would imagine that this is a man that had passed away because you can see the shaving mug and the straight razor here. I would imagine that he had had a long, lengthy illness because you can see on the nightstand that, uh, of course, there is a uh, an Aladdin lamp there, and he has an open Bible with his uh, glasses, and I'm sure that he had had uh, a long lengthy illness. When the undertaker would come out to do the embalming at the house in the bedroom where the person had passed away, then he would bring a book, and it would have different coffins uh, available that he had, and the family would have to select the coffin that he wanted. Now then, after the embalming was completed, uh, he would bathe the body, he would dress it, and then he would have to bring all of this equipment out at the same time that he brought the embalming equipment out. And this catafalque is covered with crushed velvet, crushed velvet pillow, and a crushed velvet blanket. They were still put by a window because all they had was candles and an Aladdin lamp. But at that time, uh, the funeral profession had become uh, involved enough that uh, his supply houses were bringing in an Aladdin lamp for him to sit at the head of the uh, person. Then the undertaker would go back and they showed them for two nights. And then the undertaker would go back to his uh, uh, place of business and he would uh, make the coffin that the family had selected and line it and put handles on it. And then about two hours before the funeral, he would come back with the coffin and he would place the person in the coffin and they would have a short prayer service and then go to the church, where whatever church that the funeral was going to be at. In Indiana, of course I don't know any other laws, but any, in Indiana the law was passed in 1929 that embalming had to be done in a certified room. So that meant that embalming had to be done in, that you had to bring them into the funeral home to do the embalming. There could be no more embalming done in the residence. We do have every piece of furniture that Gills purchased when they had to establish an embalming room in their funeral home. Of course, naturally, every funeral home in Indiana had to establish an embalming room in their funeral home. And now at this time, of course, you always took the uh, body back to the home for the visitation. This is the exact uh, equipment that the Gills purchased when they had to establish a embalming room in their facility. You will notice that uh, we still have the gravity injection 
And this was also available uh, in when they did the embalming in the home. The higher you put the uh, glass bowl, the more pressure you get, and the lower is less pressure. This is the embalmer's license of the three Gill brothers. Everything in here was what they purchased originally except this equipment here, but everything else. The fluid companies put out their fluid in glass bottles. And of course, naturally, they were shipped by train, so they had to be in a wooden box. Today, you know, there is no glass bottles. Everything is plastic, and they deliver it right to your door. But this is the way it was done in the early days. The crepe on the doorknob was replaced by what we call in the profession a door badge. And any time you went down a street in town or uh, on a country road and saw the door badge by the front door, then you knew someone in that house had passed away. After they had to bring the body into the funeral home for the embalming, then that meant that the family had to come to the funeral home to make their funeral arrangements and to select the casket that they uh, chose to purchase. But all of this was taken back to the home, back to the home for the visitation. And it was two nights, and the, uh, the parlor had become a living room. And uh, they would take every piece of furniture out of the living room, and the undertaker would take out uh, four, five, six dozen chairs, because, uh, you know, you would take the couch out because you could get six folding chairs where you could just sit three people on a couch. And not only did uh, you have to accommodate the casket, but people had started sending flowers. So you had to accommodate all the flowers to be displayed in the uh, room. Now you will notice the undertaker would take out the backdrop and he would uh, ask the family which wall that they wanted to, the casket set in front of. And he would, they, all the catafalque would hide the uh, church trucks that he had taken to set the casket on. Now you will notice that on the casket there is a veil. Now, in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and very early in the 60s, no house had air conditioning. And every time the uh, front door was, the screen door was open, the uh, flies would come in. And this is just uh, the only uh, reason a veil is on that casket is protect the body from the flies, gnats, and other things that uh, would be coming in. And of course, naturally, they always had a register stand and a register book where everyone would sign in as they come to the house. Yes, we can look out the front window uh, in the living room and we can see that the hearse is already here and the cars are lined up to fall in line behind the hearse. I think that this person, this home, is out in the country because we can look out the other window in the living room and see the little church down the road where the funeral is going to be held. And the cemetery that's out at the side of the church, the grave is already ready to receive the casket. Now this church truck was purchased in 1919. 
It does look very flimsy, uh, but caskets were not as heavy as they are today. But this is the best that was available in 1919. Here in this case, we have different funeral bills. I think the uh, oldest one that we have is April the 21st, 1875. The total bill was $50 and there was no embalming. All these other bills, I think, included embalming. I think the last one we have is 1940. These papers here do not have anything to do with the funeral profession as such, but they do have Joseph Gill and his wife, Mary's name on them. I think they're deeds or something. And then this is where Joseph Gill paid his taxes, 1896. And then these are cemetery deeds. We have four of those. And the oldest one is December of 1870. In December of 1895, and February of 1918, and February of 1922. Now here we have pictured the caskets that were used in the teens and the 20s. Now by then, the, uh, in the teens and the 20s, the uh, casket manufacturers had come into being and they did make caskets to be shipped from, to the undertaker from the factory. Now you will notice that this one is closed position and it does not have any hardware on it, handles. The uh, undertaker, after you had selected the uh, casket that you wanted, he would bring a book out and show you the different handles and he would put them on there himself you had a choice in the handles. And these are the caskets that were used in the 30s and the 40s and early 50s. And you'll notice how elaborate that they were. Now in uh, the late 1800s, it was a custom that if you had a death in the family, you sent invitations to the funeral. This one is 1886, 1873, 1885, and 1887. And you did send uh, an invitation to the people to attend the funeral. Mostly, a lot of funerals were in the house in those days. And this was after embalming had come into being and they could mail the invitation to you and you had time to get it. These are more invitations to funerals. Now then, the man that did establish this funeral business, he died in August of 1899, and this is his obituary. You remember we told you in the very first parlor that we came to that it was a custom for a lady to wear black six months after her husband had passed away. And this is a mourning scarf, and this is a headdress for a ladies. This, in the 30s and 40s, you would plug this in, and it would get super hot. And then you would place this thing in there, and of course it got super hot, and that's how curled a woman's hair. This is a picture of the Joseph Gill family. Mr. Gill is seated on the left-hand side, and his wife, Mary, is seated on the right-hand side, and the six children are standing behind him and between he and his wife. Now, I don't know what work the other four people went into, but the girl standing just behind her father was a 
medical doctor in Chicago, and she passed away in 1958 or 59. Uh, she was brought back here for burial in the Gill family plot. Then the boy standing beside her was the father of Hayes Gill and Bud Gill. These are old books that were used in mortuary science. Uh, we know, you know that we uh, pointed out to you in the office building that uh, Hayes Gill graduated from uh, Cincinnati College of Mortuary Science in 1922. And these two that are opened are his books that he used in college. These uh, standing up are the uh, material that I used when I was in the early, very early 50s. This was the faculty at the uh, mortuary school in Indianapolis. Lloyd Howe was the uh, owner of the facility and this was the faculty. Then these are trade journals out of 1948. This is the first electric embalming machine that was introduced to the profession in 1940. It certainly looks like a pressure cooker. You poured the embalming fluid in this uh, hole here and then uh, you could determine how much pressure you had and then this is the injection needle. I made this bust of a man when I was in mortuary school in the early 50s. Today, when a person passes away, we go to the hospital, the nursing home, or the residence in an ambulance cot to transfer the person to the funeral home. However, up through the 20s, uh, they always went in a wicker basket such as this and transferred the person to the funeral home. One of our more illustrious people of uh, Indiana, John Dillinger, I watched the story of his life history and he was from Mooresville, Indiana and he was shot by the cops in Chicago area. And when they took him from the police uh, morgue to a funeral home to have his body prepared to ship back to Mooresville, it showed him being taken from the police morgue to the funeral home in a wicker basket. These are different colored veils. You remember that you saw a veil in the home setting of the uh, casket. Uh, these are just different colored veils that were used. These are blankets that you could buy. These are two adult blankets. This is a baby blanket that you could buy from the uh, undertaker to wrap your uh, relative in. These are burial dresses that you could purchase from the funeral home. These uh, first four are all velvet type dresses and these uh, are crepe dresses. Uh, you will notice that uh, they're $12 each. They would certainly cost you a lot more today. This is a typical undertaker out of the late 1800s and the early uh, 1900s. He wore a frock tail coat. He wore striped pants, a gray vest, and the traditional top hat. You will notice that uh, you remember that the very first parlor that we came into when there was absolutely no embalming and then the very second room that you went to was when embalming was done in the bedroom where you passed away. Well, this was in between these two 
areas. This is just a viewing casket. The, ca the person was taken out of this casket and put into a coffin before the burial place uh, took place. If you had a death in your family during the night, you summoned the undertaker and he would bring out this coffin or casket and the uh, 75 pound of ice. <clears throat> now this casket is lined with galvanized. You know the old galvanized horse trough. It didn't rust nearly as quickly as tin would. It's lined in the bottom and on the sides with galvanized. And then he would chop up the ice, put six to eight inches of ice in there, and then put a rubber sheet on top of the ice. And after the person uh, was bathed and dressed, then he would place it on top of the ice. Then he would pull the uh, sheet up uh, in, on the sides of the person and stuff ice down in there. That meant that instead of having uh, the funeral, if you died today, tomorrow, that you could wait for another day, maybe for two days and have the funeral of a morning. And this was a big deal for these people. You know, uh, you, you had, if you died today, you had to have the funeral tomorrow. And by, this, by placing this ice on this person, they could delay it one day. You will notice that the head end of the uh, casket, viewing casket, is higher than the foot end. And you will also notice that there was a spigot in there. The person never floated in water. As the ice would melt, the water would run out into a, a bucket. Usually it was the grandchildren that were uh, given that duty. When the bucket was full, they would take it out and empty it and put it back under there. But anyway, uh, that was how this worked. Now this is a child's casket. It's two and a half foot long. This was before a, a stillborn or up to usually six months. Uh, then this one is three and a half foot long. It would be for a child that would fit in it. Now you will notice that we noticed we told you in the other room that we always put a panel over the glass for viewing. Now this coffin itself is five foot in length, it would be for a teenager, and uh, you can see when it was made. It's almost as old as I am. It was built in 1869, I think. Now, in the uh, instance where we took the bodies back to the house for the viewing, there were a lot of home funerals. And if they did not have an organ in the home or a pianist, then the undertaker could take this folding organ out to the house and get him a piano player and they could have music for the funeral. Now this organ folds up and it's no bigger than a uh, regular size uh, suitcase and it has a handle on the top and I'm going to show you now this is over 90 years old. I'm not a piano player but I am going to show you that the organ still works. Action. Keep in mind that this organ is over 90 years old. This display here is more or less for the younger people. Anytime a businessman or his wife 
passed away, they closed the business from the time of death until the day after the funeral. The undertaker would take out a artificial bouquet of flowers and sit at the front door of the business, whatever it was, and uh, they would have a closed sign telling who had passed away, when the funeral was, and when the uh, business would reopen. Now, today, usually, business just closes for an hour and a half while the uh, funeral is going on. But in the old days, in my early days in the business, it, they were closed from the time of the person's death until after, the day after the funeral. When the Gills uh, bought the uh, funeral home, or built the funeral home that they're operating in today, they moved in in September of 1941 before war broke out in December. And when they built this new funeral home and moved in, then they bought this Catholic equipment. Of course, naturally, it's been replaced several times, but they did keep this in the basement, and we thought it would, should be displayed up here. This is a kneeling bench, this is the torch airs, and this is the mass card holder. Now this is our funeral vehicles from different eras. This is a horse-drawn hearse and it was built in 1888. This is a Model T hearse and it was in 1912. And this is a 1921 hearse. And this is out of the 1930 a 1938 model. And this is a 1959 model. And this is a 1966 model. And we don't have anything any newer than 66. Of course, naturally, hearses are, uh, by this time in 59 and 66, they were modernistic anyway. Now then, when we first put this display in here and we started taking people through, we realized that no one, no one under 50 years of age remembered funeral homes doing ambulance service. And so then we set up this ambulance thing here and brought in uh, miniatures of the ambulances until January 1979, 95% of all ambulance service in the United States was done through funeral homes. If you needed an ambulance, you called a funeral home. And some large cities offered an emergency ambulance service, but all of their convalescent work was done through the funeral home. This is a 1916 York Hoover. You will notice how tall the cars were back then, and a, an ambulance had to be even taller. I have often thought in my early days in the funeral business about the if you were in a real bad wreck and you didn't know if you was going to live till you got to the hospital, and then here's the undertaker <laughs> lifting you out and on a stretcher, <laughs> what you would think. But, I, but that's just the way it was. I mean, people did not think anything about this because that was the way it was done. Uh, funeral homes did the uh, ambulance service, and funeral homes did advertise. I'm, I imagine on those... Uh, uh, fans over there that there was some ambulance service advertised because you advertised it very prominently in your advert. Uh, this is a uh, firm out of Tampa, Florida, and they had uh, four uh, ambulances besides their fleet of cars. This was the very first uh, all automobile funeral hearse that was used, uh, it was actually taken off of a horse-drawn hearse and mounted onto uh, 
a car chassis. And it was in January the 15th, 1909, and uh, Chicago Undertaker H.D. Ludlow led the procession. Now this was the very first all automobile uh, funeral that was conducted and F.F. Roberts conducted the uh, second documented all automobile and they had to travel 11 miles from the city of Chicago to Mount Rose Cemetery. Now up here we show they're coming out of the church and placing the coffin in a horse drawn hearse. This casket is not that old. It was built in 1930, so it is 81 years old, but we thought it was so unusual that we would uh, have it in here. The casket itself is solid zinc, and it was built in 1930, and of course you can see where the uh, paint is scratched right down to bare metal, but there has been no uh, rusting whatsoever. Zinc does not rust. On all four corners of the lid, there are these caps that are cast iron. These are cast iron, and this here is cast iron. And then it is a glass sealer. This casket was the very, very, very best you could buy in 1930. The casket itself weighs over 700 pounds. Now, <laughs> I don't know how you would have ever, I, I'm not a big man, but I weigh 188. If you put me in there, it would be over uh, almost a thousand pound, it'd be over 900 pound. And really the interior, other than this area right here, and other than this area right here, the interior is in perfect shape for it to be 81 years old. And uh, so anyway, this is why we had this displayed up here. We hope that you have enjoyed the tour of the funeral display. We have tried to not be macabre about it. We did not put uh, mannequins in any of the coffins or in any of the caskets, but we have tried to tell it just like it is. From the time that this great country was born in 1776, right on up through the Civil War when embalming was introduced to the United States and through the way we know it today. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed it. We ask you to stop by any time and take a, a personal guided tour of the facility. I personally uh, have been in this business since 1952. I had a stroke in 19, uh, 2008, uh, at the end of the 2008, and I pushed on and on, forced myself to work until uh, May of 2009, because May of 2000, uh, or 1952 was when I started in this business, so I can say that I was in the business for 57 years. It's a long time in one job, isn't it? But anyway, we hope that you enjoyed the video of the tour, and we do invite you to stop in at any time. Just call and make arrangements.